Welcome to Stargate SG-1 for the first time. Still, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Stargate SG-1 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm watching Stargate SG-1 for the 47th time. But for the very first time, I am looking for what Stargate is trying to teach us. Searching out those sci-fi messages. I've never looked at the show through that lens before, so I'm doing it for the first time with that particular idea in mind. You know, searching out those things where does it hold up a mirror to society, give us hope things can be better in the future, or does it just tell us how to be better people to one another? This week, Brent, we're watching the fourth episode of the third season of Stargate, Legacy. Mm. Last week, I guessed, I predicted that this is going to be about the legacy of the Tauri Stargate. We're going to get some of the more ancient history around it. We'll find out pretty soon how close or far off I was. Before we get there, why don't you tell us a little bit about Legacy? Yeah, well, today, there's very little bit. Today, uh, fourth episode, season three, Legacy, original air date, July 16th, 1999. So, you know, these people that watched the show way back when, they've had four good weeks of Stargate right in a row without a break, right in the middle of the summer. Directed by one of our favorites, Jeff, Mr. Peter DeLuise. Oh, nice. Uh, with that, anything else I have, we're going to talk about on the backside of this show. So, why don't we jump into it? If you guys are joining us for the very first time, here's how this is going to work. Jeff and I are getting ready to go watch this episode right now. Uh, what that means is if you are hanging out with us on YouTube, you're going to catch the reaction. We're going to do a reaction video to this episode of Stargate. Jeff and I watching it together in real time. If you want to catch the unedited version of that, the full version, head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash nerds. And you guys can... Uh, subscribe there and check out all of that good stuff along with all the other stuff we have going on here with by nerds for the first time everything uh, it's all right out there there's a lot of content on there and if you're listening on a podcasting app also go check out the patreon because there's a ton of content there that you're not seeing and it's pretty cool and an awesome community but you're about to gate into the future you're going to catch us on the backside of the episode to hear my for the first time reaction to hear about those sci-fi messages that brent might have found in the episode so what do you say brent let's start this one legacy All right, Jeff. Uh, well, you have just watched Legacy for the very first time. I've watched it for the first time looking for messages and whatnot. But, Jeff, you get to go first. Talk, Take us through your experience of Legacy. This one took me on a journey. Like, at first, I thought this was going to be a ghost story. And I was really concerned because I'm like, we this will be the third episode almost in a row that we've had some invisible thing. I'm like, really, really? Well, wasn't that. So then I thought... It's called Legacy, right? And it, it's with Daniel, and they're trying to say some stuff. These group, the Limvris, who are another uh, faction of the symbiotes, I think it's interesting, as a side note, we call them Goulds, right? We call them, uh, that's the name for them. But the Goulds are one group of this, this symbiotes. There's also the Tok'ra, there's the, there's the Jaffa, who are not really, but they're just the incubators, really. And now the Limvris, they're symbiotes. Stop calling them ghouls. That's a very specific group of symbiotes. Well, I, I think I think the the species we would call ghouls, ghouls. And but then of the of the species you have here's the Tokra and here's the Limphus. They're all still the same species. They're all still the same creature. It just their politics and how they act and how they behave are very, very different. And then you have the system lords, which uh, you know probably make up 95% or 90% or whatever of all the ghouls out there. You know, uh, I don't know if that's an accurate number or not, but I did notice talking about the system Lords, a real uh, change in language in this episode from past seasons. They're really, really focusing on calling them system Lords. Mm. The, the Limvris weren't trying to take out the Gould. They were trying to take out the system Lords. Right. And so it's so maybe yeah, that is kind of the thing where that makes sense. They're they're all ghouled, but some of them are different flavors. And now we're calling them the system lords. Right, right. But so as I as I'm watching, I'm thinking they're trying to tell their story. They want their legacy 
to live on through Daniel. I'm like, oh my gosh, is this Stargate's inner light episode? Not that either. No, uh, Daniel starts losing his mind, and we get uh, we get a little bit of a look at how people with mental health challenges were treated in the 90s. I don't think that was an intentional uh, move on the episode, but it was very accurate in what it did. I have to call out Michael Shanks. Incredible. Yeah. In this episode. So well done. He's in this padded room, and like he's flush, and he's sweaty. And he's seen things that no one else has seen. And he's kind of talking to himself a little bit. And it's so believable. It's so great. Fast forward to the very end of the episode. And we have Dr. Frazier going through the same kind of cycle. N- not not good. That was that was not well done. Not not nearly on the same level as as what Michael Jakes did. Um, if, if I can add to that, though, Jeff. Yeah. Amanda Tapping in this episode. When she's watching Daniel, the way... Like everything is emoting through her face and her eyes and she's barely saying a word. And, and you really see that coming through on her part. Teal was just as stoic as he always is. Jack was concerned and there, but he also certainly was, was concerned. But I mean, Amanda just really, really had that, that going for her. But my note here, my God, Michael Shanks can act. It was really good. And another thing with Amanda Tapping also, it hit me how when we're around people that are sick or have bad things going on in their life, we tend to look upon them with pity. And I felt that's what Sam was kind of doing. She was hurting for her friend Daniel, but there's also like this, this thing of pity. And I know for me, this may not be for everyone, but if I were in Daniel's spot and I had enough agency to know what was going on, I'd be like, don't, don't pity me. Like, I don't want your pity, but it also feels like the right thing to do. I'm not, I'm not at all denigrating Sam for what she did. It was just it made me think about how like, that's our natural reaction, but it almost never actually helpful to look at it that way. Oh, I, and I, but I do think, you know, where you and I at some point realized Daniel did have his agency and he did have his faculties. No one else realized he had them at that point. Exactly. And the point that, that Amanda was in the room with him. I mean, uh, that Sam was in the room with him. He did not actually have his faculties. At that point, no, not at all. But I hear what you're saying. And it's an interesting point. I don't know if you'll bring it up when you talk about the messages, but it really was a real through line in this episode was people blindly believing what they believed and not being open to anything outside of that. There's a real short path in this that honestly, Jack had almost did at one point, but had a really close chance to just be like, Okay, Daniel, t- tell me what you're seeing. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what I should test. Well, let's try, what's the harm in trying this thing out? But instead, they're like, there's nobody here, Daniel. What, what's wrong with you, man? Can't you see? It's just, just kind of interesting. But at that point, right, things change. We hear Michello's voice, which is a great callback to Holiday. And in Holiday, we found out that, you know, he was me. He's an inventor, right? And it, all of his inventions were meant to kill Gould. And this was just, this whole thing was one of his inventions getting picked up. So I don't know, it was, it was really, it was, this was a, it was an interesting episode. I, I think for, Michael Shanks is acting for me really, really takes this uh, to the level that, that it's at. And I think the fact, like the, the writing of this episode was done in a way that really took me on a journey that I wasn't sure what it was. I felt confused just like everyone else on the show was not sure what was going on. I thought it was really well crafted in, in how they put it together. My beef with the episode, my beef is the big thing that saved the day was putting a vial of blood into a centrifuge. Like the most basic, like hi, it's phlebotomy day one. Yeah. And like, that was like this big tense moment of like, oh my God, you're going to do that. That that really sucked a lot of wind out of the air for me on that one. The question I have out of this one. Mm -hmm. So they put this uh, protein strain that you get when a, when a ghoul dies inside of you, gave it to Dr. Frazier, gave it to Jack. Are they Jolinard now? Are they going to be good? And my funny observation out of this one that I just love, and I think, again, it shows the power and the the skill behind the writing and character development in Stargate. We saw Michello for one episode. Mm-hmm. And in that one episode, he was actually Daniel as Michello, which, you know, is pretty cool if you know what's going on there. Yep. 
But I just thought it was so, so the little thing, the little seti eel goes into their ear and it's meant to go and kill the gould and then pop out. Yeah. And it was designed, it's just this little invention designed to be like when the gould dies to pop out and be like, <laughs> I killed you, you know, or, oh, you, you delivered me to the thing. It's so Michello, so Michello to like put a little voice recording at the end. That was great. So I, I do want to just call this out. So you had the Limbris. Assume this worked the way that we saw it. The Limbris go in, they operate this pad, they get the little things in their ears, one one each. There's 10 in a pad, they got nine of them, there's one left over, whatever. But each one of those nine, it would have gone in, made them incredibly sick, as we saw with Teal'c, and killed the Gould. Did it kill the host, or did it leave the host alive like it did Daniel and Janet and Jack and Teal'c? And it should have left them alive. Should have then that means that they stayed in the room and died of starvation or suffocation. Exactly. That's, oh, and I don't think Michelle thought one all the way through, but that is the, uh, that's the harsh reality of that particular situation. Like, yikes. Prepare for incoming gold channel communication. Before we gate into the rest of this episode, did you know you're missing most of the content from this podcast? Stargate SG-1 for the first time has an active and exciting Patreon that you can join right now by clicking the link in the show notes. Not only will you get access to the full unedited podcast and reaction videos, you'll also be able to join a growing, vibrant, maybe even an intergalactic community. Subscribers even get access to all of our content from Babylon 5 for the first time. Don't miss out on this content and the amazing people. Just click the link in the show notes. Tilk thinks you should do it right now. Indeed. Yeah, it's hard. And, it, and I think, too, I have to imagine that if I was like a fully, what do they say, fully blended with my Gould... Mm -hmm. and my ghoul died that's got to be a traumatic and sad experience you know or, or maybe it's very liberating but also you know traumatic in its own way yeah you have that plus no food limited air water and again a theme that i'm noticing in this and babylon 5 you put people in a room where are they going to the bathroom not on those pads that uh, daniel had in his room <laughs> now the 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 liveris, yeah they're probably just going it was probably probably gross but well no they have zat guns i can just zat it away yeah, that's, that's my take on the episode. All in all, pretty good. Did you get any uh, sci-fi messages out of this one? You know, I feel like I should have, and I really, I was looking. I was really looking. Is this a commentary on mental health? No, it really wasn't. You know, it it really it really wasn't. I, Daniel did, uh, Michael Shanks, I'm sorry. Michael Shanks, amazing, amazing acting. You know what it reminds me of? Hmm. Uh, Jerry Ryan. In that episode of Voyager where she had the the multiple personality thing going on and she was in and all of a sudden you're like, oh, Jerry Ryan can freaking act. Like, yeah, this is that episode to me for Michael Shanks. I, I do kind of want to pick up a few things, a few threads in which you talked in which you kind of started down that path, because I do think it is something that we see there and we see it even in my favorite word juxtaposed later on in the episode they come in daniel's having issues and you say it at the beginning like he's telling people like hey this thing's going on rather than being like okay what happened he says at the beginning when we were in the room i felt something brush past me should have been a clue to say hey let's go do this but no mr doctor dude walks in guy that we haven't seen since episode three and is like oh it's gotta be schizophrenia let's put him in a padded cell if anything else happens and they had that in their head and they just, they went forward with that rather than go, did something happen? Hey, we've got this mystery. How did they die? How did they, how did they die locked in a room? Wait, something's going on with Daniel. We were just in that room, felt something brush past him. There's gotta be something going on. This isn't uh schizophrenia. This isn't, we were just having headaches from gate travel. They just went with what this doctor said and let that color everything and, and miss really what should have been fairly obvious. I think it's it's in, in like medical terms or even scientific terms, it's a rule out. Yeah. You know, so yes, the the apparent thing, it's textbook schizophrenia, he said. So that's apparent, 
but let's be curious and let's rule out this kind of weird thing that happened on our mission. Let's just, just humor us. Frankly, even if they had to put Daniel in the padded room, somebody needs to be going back to that, that room and checking out stuff on that planet or, you know, uh, go with the big hazmat, whatever. Cause we didn't know that it could go through the gloves just yet. Right. But here's the thing. As soon as Daniel's in that room and he says, Michello, he said it twice. As soon as he says, Michello, that should include in Jack Teal, Sam to go, Whoa, wait a minute. Something's there. Um, I get the idea. Hey, we all saw Michello die. How is this Michello? Um, leftover tech is not hard to fathom, right? Come on guys. It was, it was the whole big deal at the end of holiday. Like this is my stuff. Right. Right. So it, it just feels like that should have, should have been a thing as soon as he said that. But then later, later when the one doctor is there janet and sam and and jack are in the room and they're all freaking out and the dude's other is like yeah we can't separate out the protein sorry we can't do it can't do it it takes this you'd have to do this you have to do that gotta separate the protein and janet i'm gonna push back against what you said jeff okay the whole climax has put the thing in centrifuge no the whole thing wasn't put in centrifuge it was solved the problem so the problem is we can't separate out the protein well you don't have to separate out the protein just get it to the plasma that's what, that's the, the, honestly, I love the genius of that. The simplicity of it. Uh, I really do. The problem are the red blood cells. Get rid of the red blood cells. Everything else can go. Yeah. So, hey, we're going to do it that way. I don't like the idea that they put that thing in teal mm. and that it worked for teal or that it worked for, for really Jack and Jack. Um, mm, I'm going to tell you this because I don't want you thinking about this later. Okay. Because it, I don't want it eating up mind space for you if this was babylon 5 i would punch myself for telling you this right now it's fair we're never going to hear about this again from for jack and janet and teal okay well ne- it, never will we hear about it again i think that makes sense also i mean i think about a lot of the vaccines and things that we get that impact proteins that doesn't last forever yeah but they should this this show is really good at picking up old threads it feels like they should have i just don't think they thought this one all the way through is is honestly what I think ha- they needed it for this plot, and so here we go. That's fair. Very rarely are you ever going to hear about about Jack ever having been infested with a ghoul for any amount of time whatsoever. Like we probably just got the last mention of that now. Which, frankly, if it's the last time they mention Hathor, I'm okay with that. I, they're never going to mention him being a Jaffa again for 20 minutes. Like certain things just just don't come back up. My pushback on your pushback is <sighs> can't push back on my pushback. I want to push back on your pushback on my pushback. But really, like, so I get that she was under duress. There was a lot going on. But what would it have taken just to say, we just need to get rid of, like, she eventually got there after this whole argument. Just, we're just getting rid of the red blood cells. Because as soon as she said that, dude was like, you're brilliant. Now I can help you do this thing. Yeah. But they had, to, to your other point, they had to have this, this is my way. This is my way conflict. They weren't saying, they weren't communicating you can't do it. You need this equipment. I can do it. I have a centrifuge. You can't. I can. You can't. And it took her eventually. Well, I'm just going to pull out the red blood cells. Boom. Now they're working together. Because when she first said it, and I and I noted that this time, she first said she's like, centrifuge. It's like she just couldn't say anything else other than the one word. Mm-hmm. And then later she's leaning over. She's in a worse state. Oh, you don't have to get rid of all the things. Just get rid of the red blood cells. Like, she spells it out for him, you know, where, like, wait a minute, why didn't you just say that a few minutes ago? <laughs> like, if you had the ability to say that. So I'm with you on that aspect of it. But I do love the the genius of, of Janet Frazier, frankly. Yeah, anyway, all of that to say, I think when you look at the, that conversation between Janet and the doctor versus the team and that other doctor, McKenzie, you really see this... Are you just going to go with what the expert says or are you going to go with the person in front of you? And sometimes you need to go with what the expert says. Like, I, I'm not saying to ignore the expert, but you also have to take in other factors. Yeah. Is that a lesson? Is it a sci-fi message? No, maybe. I don't. I, th- I think it could be if it le- if it led to anything. I think this this was a thing that we're reading in it right. that I don't think was the point at all and if it was the point the message would be be curious 
right? But that was never a part of what we saw. It was never where it was. This was just conflict. I like, I think it really was just conflict. It was stupid conflict that had nothing to do with being sci-fi. It's just people are conflict. So I'm, I'm giving this one zero chevrons, Jeff. I, like I can try to dig it out, but I think it's a great episode. In my opinion, I don't know about you. I think it's a great episode. Mm-hmm. Fantastically acted, fantastically directed. Uh, the playback is all skittery. Uh, sorry, that's my fault. Uh, not theirs, but zero chevrons. That's the rating. That's the message portion. Jeff, you get to rank it though. How good was this episode? How much did you enjoy this episode placing it in our definitive season three ranking of Stargate SG one? Currently our season three ranking sits at number one is the episode fair game from last week. Then we have into the fire and then we have Seth, Jeff, where do you place legacy? Where I'm going to place legacy, I think, is more of a commentary on the quality of season three so far, because where I'm going to put it, you're going to be like, really? That's where you're putting it? Yeah, because like everything has been good so far. Mm. This is going to be our number four episode. Whoa. Yeah, and I'm saying that really because like I was between three and four for it, but I enjoyed like Seth just had more going on and more continuity, I guess more contiguous storytelling to it. Oh, but it being a number four by no means means I did not like it. Legacy is going to stay in the top five for a while, at least for one more week, but I, I'm going to guess a couple more weeks. Like mm. it's, this is a good episode. Okay. Okay. I listen, I couldn't change it. And even if I wanted to, even if I wanted to personally, I would rank it uh, of the three. This would be my favorite episode of the season so far. I love this episode. Really? But that's personal preference. Personal preference. Into the Fire is good. I like Fair Game a whole lot. Seth, I kind of leave down there. It's it's not my favorite episode. Personal preference. Uh, But I get where you're coming from. You know, but I think that just goes to show uh, the quality of the season. Every single episode here, I would watch again and again and again. There's not, there's not, and there's not a skip. There's not a laundry episode. These are sit down and watch episodes so far. I love it. I love that. Well, speaking of that, then uh, it's time to get on to the next episode. And the next episode we are watching, Jeff, is an oh oh. I'm really curious where you're going to go. I promise you this, Jeff. We're going to have some messages next week. Mm. This episode is called Learning Curve. Jeff, would you care to take a guess of what Learning Curve? I'll I'll give you this one little hint. This is about as sci-fi as you gonna get. Really? Mm-hmm. What you got? Of course, I was gonna go with like, hey, this group of uh, former terrorists come on board and yeah, get a little out of line, and then somebody has to train them <clears throat> how to do things. I will. I'll I'll take it a step further, Jeff. This episode could play in Star Trek in any series immediately. Script as it is, change some names. Put it on a starship. This episode plays like a Star Trek episode. So this is going to be this is going to be new technology that shows up on their doorstep, and they've got to figure out how to use it. This is a game cha- potential game changer for the game changer, either to the good or can kill everybody. And they have to figure this thing out. And there's going to be within the SGC, within the government piece, there's going to be a faction on both sides. We can weaponize this thing, or this thing can really help us do uh, do good things. Well, Jeff, as I always say, you're a good guesser. Sure. Yeah. Well, we will find out right here next time on Stargate SG-1 for the first time. Thank you guys so much for joining us and enduring the jitter. So sorry. It's technology. We'll get it figured out, and it's not going to happen next time. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your shows. Please leave us a rating, a review. Share this show with somebody you know that loves Stargate SG-1 or it needs to get into the gate, just like my good buddy Jeff right over there. Until next time, guys, we will see you. Hey, Brent. Care. So close. Yes, Jeff. What's up? I told you. <laughs> he's, he's right there. He's right there. For crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs>